Hey, I tell you, there's sometimes you just got to stop. You've got to pause and just be thankful. You just have to stop and, th- and, and just be thankful and grateful for what you have. And, I mean, today is one of those days. We just finished up vacation Bible school. Had around a little over 200 each day. Uh, just great number of volunteers. You know, we weren't, we weren't short anywhere. Uh, the kids... Uh, their, their offering that they took up was uh, right around $1,500. That will build, and the money was going to sleep in heavenly peace, where we build the beds for children in Martin County uh, who do not have beds to sleep in. That will build six beds right there. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, we got to have a, te- a breakfast earlier, a hot breakfast put on by our teens and their families, uh, raising money for their mission trip in a couple of weeks. Uh, it just goes on and on. Uh, the things that we do to have to be thankful for. So I just like to say, let's be grateful to God for everything that we've got here as a church. Now, I'm, and I'm so grateful that this study we've been able to go through in the book of James is we're kind of winding down. Next week will be our last week uh, working through the book of James. You know, some weeks we look at 10 verses. Another week it's four verses. Uh, and it's just based on what the topic, what the theme that James is doing Uh, how many verses it is. You know, sometimes it takes longer to say something that we need to say. Uh, Sometimes it can be said very shortly. And if you've probably got memories of your mom and dad like I do, sometimes they didn't have to say anything. They just had to look at you. You know, and you got the message. I remember I was, it was shortly after getting out of Bible college and my first job as a youth minister was up in Virginia, Virginia, and a family asked if I would come to court just to be there, you know, like it's moral support. They were involved in something in court, and I went. My first time I'd ever been in court, uh, and, and so I was watching, and this other attorney had a character witness up talking, and uh, he was just rambling on, just kept on talking. Kept, and I'm a, I like to observe people as things are like that are happening. So I kept looking at the judge as this guy just rambled on. And I watched the judge, and he just, he did this. He looked at the, the attorney and just went. And that was it. And the attorney stood right up. But that's enough, Mr. Smith. We thank you very much for your, and I was going, wow, now that's power. You know, just to roll your eyes and you change the whole court setting. And I always thought that was so cool. And we've come to one of those places in the book of James where it's very short. It's one verse and he says something that's so powerful. James 5 verse 12 says this. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, or you will be condemned. Now, I don't want you to get too excited when I say we're just looking at one verse. You're going, we're going to get out early today. You know, now, it doesn't necessarily mean I hope I don't keep you too long each week anyway. I try to be conscious of that. But it's one verse, but there's so much to be said about it. Let's read it again. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else, Let your yes be yes and your no, no, or you will be condemned. That first phrase, above all, that's given scholars kind of some fits over the decades, centuries. What what does he mean when he says above all? Is he saying this is the most important thing I've ever said? Is this above all the sins of the tongue? Is this whatever it is? Probably not. Some people say it's just basically saying in conclusion because he's about ready to wrap it up. And he's saying, here we are at the end. But regardless of what you think he means exactly by saying above all, he's saying this for sure. This short statement I'm getting getting ready to make is important. You need to listen and don't miss it. Because it's, it's extremely important to what we are about to talk about. Because you see... The book of James, what we've been talking about, has so much to do with being an authentic Christian, authentic faith. And it's impossible to be an authentic Christian if you can't match your deeds and your words together. And so when he talks about words, they're more than just words. It's a matching of of your words and your deeds. He goes on and he says, do not swear. And sometimes, you know, you have to ask, what does this mean? Well, 
one of the best things we can do here is first say what it doesn't mean in this context. In this context. Taking an oath. You know, when you go to court, if you've been in court, you have to swear an oath. You take an oath. Or your, or your wedding vows, when you get married, you know, you're taking, you're making a vow, you're, you're ma- taking an oath. So God's not speaking about that because throughout the Bible, he talks about taking an oath, making a vow. Even Paul said when he was writing to a couple of the churches, he said, as God is my witness, what I'm telling you is true. God is my witness to this. You know, he could, he's not talking about profanity. Now, don't get too excited. Doesn't mean if you, if you're one of those like to say a cuss word, doesn't mean you can. Because there's, there's plenty of other places that, Paul, that the Bible talks against using profanity. About taking the Lord's name in vain. About using coarse language, insensitive language. So he's not just talking about that. So what kind of swearing is he talking about in this context? Well, at this time in history, the Jewish people were really bad uh, all through their history. And by now, it had really gotten out of hand that when they would say something, they'd want to add credibility to what they said. So they would swear by something important. By the t- I, I promise by the temple of God. I promise by the gods in heaven. I promise by the throne in heaven. And they would say things like that. And, and they would swear that to try to make it give more credibility to what they're saying. And, and James here says... Don't do that. Don't swear by something that's outside of your authority or your control. It does not impress God. It really doesn't impress people. Jeremiah the prophet, Hosea, they spoke against the people because they would swear by Jesus, by God's name, then go right out and do the evil. And he says, you're not to do that. You know, I wonder sometimes, why do we say things that we do? Why do we say, make such bold and brash statements? I immediately thought about when Jesus stood before Pilate on that last week when the trials were going on. And he stood before Pilate and they were trying to convince him to find Jesus guilty. And Pilate said, and I'm just paraphrasing here, but Pilate just said, I find nothing wrong with this man. I've questioned him. There's nothing wrong. He's done nothing wrong. And the people just kept yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And he would come back and say, he's done no wrong. And they would just keep getting louder. And this is what Pilate finally says in Matthew 27, verse 24. He says, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the people, or in, in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. And that should have been enough to get their attention. But to know what they said? All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. That should cause a little bit of a chill to run down your spine. That they were saying, they were willing to say, let all the guilt fall on us and let it go all with the blood run down to our children as well. Making bold, brash statements, rash statements. Simon Peter did the same thing. You know, and he completely contradicted Jesus. He said, when Jesus said, you'll all forsake me, he says, no, nah, I won't, Jesus. Jesus said, I'll tell you what, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And instead of a bold statement on Simon Peter's point, he should have been reflecting Inside praying for God to give him the strength not to de- deny Jesus. You see, James is addressing, addressing a character issue, not just words. He's addressing a character issue. Let your word stand for itself because our words mean something. David Jeremiah said this about, <clears throat> about the, in, in this character issue, integrity. He said, integrity is keeping my commitment even if the circumstances when I made the commitment have changed. Let that sink in for just a moment. You know, I'm not a big proponent of uh, social media. I mean, I just see so much bad come out of Facebook and things like that. But when you do run across something good, you need to share it. And it was on Father's Day, as a a young girl who went to the church that I went to right when I was 
uh, graduated from high school, she had posted something about her father, memory of her father. Uh, and she's, she's younger than me, quite a bit younger than me, but she, uh, and I knew her dad, I knew the business that he ran, and I, I knew her as a little girl. And she wrote about that when she was 19 and her dad's run their business, she, was, uh, on, she would help her dad in the business when she was out of college and on breaks, and it was Christmas break, and he wanted her to drive a delivery of, uh, uh, of metal up to uh, Radford, Virginia, and that's up in the mountains. And when she left, remember this, we're talking about the early 90s here. When she left, it was, you know, cloudy, but she went on up there. She made the delivery. Then it started snowing and started coming back. The snow was just beginning to snow harder and harder. There's no cell phones to call. You can't look at your weather app. And she just keeps going, saying, I've got to keep going. I've got to get home. She meant as far as she could, no cars on the road. She got to finally there in Bassett, Virginia, right there. If you're not familiar where I'm from, and it's, you know, it's got there, and the hills are too great, and she couldn't get up one of the hills. And so she left her car. It's just getting dark. She leaves the truck. She walks to a gas station. It was just about to close, and she asked the man, can I use your phone? She called her dad and told him where he said, he said, I'll be there to get you. And they lived still a pretty good ways. But he said, I'll be there to get you. And the owner of the gas station said, you're welcome to come home with uh, me. Come to our, my wife and I said, you're welcome to come with us. You know, this was, like I say, it was a more innocent time. He said, you're welcome to come home with us. She says, no, my dad's coming to get me. So she walked back to her truck, and she sat there with the engine running for several hours. And she said she finally saw one set of headlights coming over the hills. And she said, I never saw a bigger smile on my dad's face than when he had me. You know, our words mean something. Our commitments mean something. When we say yes, let it be yes. If we say no, let it be no. Now, there's another option or another thought I want us to go to here and I don't know if this is James meant this particularly here but it's something to think about look at James 5 12 again above all my brothers do not swear not by heaven or by earth or by anything else let your yes be yes and your no no or you will be condemned James sets the standard here of yes and no. And our word should stand on that yes and no. But what is in between yes and no? What word? Maybe. Maybe. And we kind of love that word. Maybe. You ever look at the definition of maybe? Possibly, but not certainly. Certainly. Well, that's a big help, isn't it? You know, I, I, I even did some research that this week. I was just looking up, what does maybe mean? And, so, and it was, it's interesting that when a man says maybe, it means one thing. When a woman says maybe, it means something else. You know, it just, it just gets, so, gets so funny and complicated how it goes on. Now, I understand that not every question can be answered by yes or no. You know, not every question is a yes or no. If you were to come up to me and say, Greg, are you still wearing uh, uh, Janice's dresses? And I go, no. He said, well, you mean you used to? <laughs> you know, you see, there's no yet, there's not a yes and no. There takes some, takes some explanation in there, you know. So not everything is yes or no, but we need to be careful that we don't live in the land of maybe where we never make a decision. Or we never make the commitment. You see, maybe seems like a safe place to be because we're not committed. But life will call us to commit at some point or another. Think about this. The important things in life, maybe doesn't cut it. Maybe just doesn't cut it. Doctor, am I pregnant? Maybe. Will you marry me? Maybe. Come on, ref. Is that a touchdown or what? Maybe. 
do these pants make me look fat? I don't know that there is an answer for that. In the physical, in the physical world, maybe just doesn't cut it. But in the spiritual realm, it definitely doesn't cut it. Do you believe in God? Well, maybe. Are you ready to follow Him? Eh, maybe. Are you ready for what comes after this life? Maybe. It just doesn't cut it. Jesus dealt with this in the interaction He had with a group of people that explains the disposition perfectly. In Luke chapter 9, starting with verse 57, it says this, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus said, Be careful what you're saying. Be careful what you're saying you're going to do. Verse 59, He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And in this culture, that means his father is dead. It means that he's up in years. I'll, I need to stay until he passes away. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Be careful of your pronouncements. Verse 61. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, here it is. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. There's no place for maybe. There's no place for maybe. There's no place for living in between a yes and a no. It just doesn't work in Jesus' world. Someone, we had a revival speaker he came several times and spoke here. And many of you, some of you may even remember this story. Uh, Pete Kunkel was the preacher's name. and He's a preacher up in Burlington area. Uh, and he told about that a, a guy that had started coming to his church, become a Christian, who was kind of rough around the edges, unrefined. He just kind of called it as he saw it. And he wanted to take him, get him involved more. And he said, hey, I want you to go with me this Tuesday night. I'm going to make a visit. And I want you to just come with me. And so he went with him, and they went to visit a couple. They had been coming to church some, and they were very, very well-to-do. They went, huge house, very fancy house. They went in, people just nice as they could be, and they sat down. And as they did their small talk, Pete said his, his friend just kind of sat over there and didn't say anything. And then Pete finally approached and says, we'd really love to see you make a decision for Christ. And the, fa the husband and wife began to talk about, well, we like the church, but. And we know we want to follow Jesus, but. And we know that, that, that it's time that we make this decision, but. And we're gone so much. We'd love to be there, but we're go we've got another home, and we're gone so much. And this just kept on. And finally, Pete's friend just finally, just out of the blue, said, if you're not careful, you're going to slide right on your butts into hell. Pete just said, oh, my gosh. <laughs> he said, I got, got out of there just as quick as we could, and he said, we'll never see those people again. He said, the next Sunday, they were at church. The next Sunday, they were at church. The next Sunday, they came forward. And he says, they came forward. The man kind of reached in to hug Pete, and he just whispered in his ear. He says, we decided we didn't want to slide on our butts into hell. <laughs> Land of maybe just doesn't work. Possibly one of the greatest speeches that there's ever been given, ever delivered, was delivered by a man who knew that his time was coming to an end. Coming to an end as a, a, a leader in Israel and actually even coming close to the end of his life. And he called together the people that he had served and led for many decades. And he, has, he addresses the people. And, and he tells them, he said, you must 
follow God. And they all said, we will. We'll follow God in this new promised land. Uh, this was Joshua. Joshua had had the reins passed to him from Moses, the, another great leader. And he had led the people uh, courageously. Joshua had. And he says, but no, you have to follow God. You must obey him in all things. And they said, oh, we will, we will. And Joshua just wouldn't let up on these things. He just kept going. He says, I know you won't. He said, you've got to follow him. And this is finally what it, how it finally ended up. In Joshua 24, start with verse 21, it says this. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. And then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. Apparently, they were still clinging to some of those old gods they had brought from Egypt. From the surrounding land. He says, throw them away. And he ended up by saying this, or this being said, and the people said to Joshua, we will. Serve the Lord our God and obey Him. They said, yes. And Joshua told me, he says, your very words are witnesses to what you have claimed here today. You know, James has made it very clear. Jesus made it clear, very clear. Joshua makes it very clear. We are to get off the maybe train and commit and let our own words be the witness against us or the witness for us to follow God. Commit to Him wholly. Now, I don't know where you are right now. I, and uh, I was talking with somebody after the service today, and they, said, I, and they were talking about just how they, so much they need to red, rededicate their life to following Him in every day. And isn't that true of all of us? To move out of that maybe land and commit to following Him. So wherever you are today, today is an important day to what you decide to say to God. Yes or no. Definitely not maybe.